to have such a, a big crowd here, but it's an interesting topic, an important topic, and fits in really well with the, uh, with the forum. So I am Andy Lyons, and I am pleased to introduce this workshop on advancing decision support for climate adaptation and ag and natural resources. I am working, I work with the UC Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. So myself and Tapan Patak are the co-organizers of this session. Uh, so warm welcome to everybody. And I'll introduce our speakers who represent a, a different range of organizations, much like the symposium itself. So uh, hopefully you're gonna like this. So quickly, I'll go through the agenda. I'm just gonna give a few opening remarks and then we'll switch it over to the stars of the show, our, our, our five presenters. So essentially we have a two hour session and the first half roughly will be uh, our presenters sharing the work they've been doing around decision support uh, for climate adaptation. And then we'll, the, for the second part of the, of the workshop, we'll move into to breakout discussions because really, you know, we build this as a workshop, but it's equally a listening session because our goal here, and I think the goal of the forum in general is to have discussions and we want to hear from you about what your interests are, what your needs are, um, and how you're thinking about decision support. So this is kind of a rough outline of where we're going to go. So, but first, why decision support as a theme or topic for a session? Uh, it's, it's a good question. But to start things off, we, we definitely know that climate is changing and we have a pretty good idea of how climate is changing. There's a very good historical record of weather, you know, the precipitation and temperature, the variability from place to place, from year to year. So we have a very strong record of what the climate has been. Um, that's pretty well known. We also have pretty good understanding of what the future is gonna look like. Uh, it's definitely not a crystal ball, but the climate models, and we just heard uh, in the room next door, a session about the new generation of climate data that's currently being produced under the fifth climate change assessment. The, the models do a really good job at both understanding the past and the present, and they've been well built out. The next generation of climate data is also, or climate models is going to be smaller spatial scale and smaller time frames. So, uh, there's a lot. There's been a lot of good progress, and we know what the models are good at and where they uh, where they're approximate. There's also been a lot of research over many many decades about the importance and the impacts about uh, around weather on things that we really care about, such as water systems, electricity, human health. We know how weather and climate affect things like plants and crops and ecosystems, and pests, and pathogens. So there's a really rich body of research built over many generations to understand the importance and the impacts of weather on things that we care about, as well as how we can, make, how we can adapt um, to, to changing and maybe different types of uh, uh, unfavorable weather or climate conditions, technical, policy, collective action, and so on and so forth, right? So we have adaptation models, we have impact models. Decision support is what bridges these two domains. Because really, unless you are a climate scientist, you're probably not interested in so much in what the temperature and precipitation are gonna look like at the in the coming decades, but what the impacts of those changes will be on things like human health and crops and pests. And this is where decision support comes because both of these domains are, they're pretty technical and complicated. There's a lot of nuances and variability. Decision support tools are what bring these domains together for applications to make them more practical and importantly, more user-friendly. All right, so that's, the, that's sort of the rationale for this focus for a uh, session. And what do we mean by decision support? We're taking this pretty broadly as we're thinking about it. Uh, I know when I have a difficult decision to make, such as you know maybe what kind of car to buy and a domain that I don't know a lot about, I turn to my people, my network. So decision support starts with, with our people and, and our networks. Maybe people who have a lot more experience than you know, on the land, our elders, our communities, the experts in these areas. Uh, forecasts, you know, just 
the weather report is what a lot of people use, at least in the short term, but there's also medium term forecasts for the rest of the season. There's five to 10 year forecast, and then there are these forecasts that go out decades. So they, they, they are also kinds of information to help us make decisions. And then of course, there are various guides as you get more specific to specific applications, guides and, and checklists and you know trainings that you can go through to think about these things. Custom data or novel data sets is something else that we can produce uh, that will help you transform the forecast of the future into something that's more practical. And then of course, apps, whether that's a phone app or a web app or some other kind of tool, these are all different types of uh, decision support. So with that kind of introduction, we have a phenomenal set of speakers. Uh, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves because I wouldn't do justice to them. Uh, but we have uh, Janet Harton from UC Ag and Natural Resources. Michael Wolf is going to, from CDFA, will talk about some of the work they've been doing. Bob Klein, very seasoned uh, researcher with the California Pistachio Research Board. Roman Manley from the California Department of Water Resources, which of course has been uh, at the forefront of thinking about climate change impacts and preparing for those. And then Tapan Patak, also from UC A&R, uh, will, will finish us out um, and lead us into the breakout discussions. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over to Janet for the first presentation. Thank you, Andy. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Thanks to the panel and thanks mostly to you for taking time from a busy session to uh, come and join us. I'm really excited to be able to talk about something from sort of the end rather than the start position. Keep in mind, this is all fluid. But so often I think you hear University of California researchers and scientists asking for money. And I'm gonna report some of the use of that money and how we can partner with you, other decision makers, cities, grassroots community groups to be able to use our climate resilient trees that we've identified from a number of tools that I'll briefly share with you today, but mostly talk about how that the beginning has matched with users both in the middle and then listening sessions to ensure that those that we really need to help to enha enhance the tree canopy palette in neighborhoods with also have a piece of the pie and also have, have a stake in deciding what species are interested in and really driving the long-term upkeep of these urban forestry endeavors. The first thing I wanted to say is that we have urban heat islands that aren't getting any cooler. And I had in the first slide a picture of two weeks ago in Palm Springs, I'm having a, a two, it's about a two and a half year project that's summarizing the difference in impervious surface temperatures, living, per, living surfaces, and the difference that trees can make. So less than two weeks ago out in Coachella Valley in Palm Springs, I measured the surface temperature of synthetic turf at 173 degrees. That's really hot. That's actually statistically one to two degrees above and beyond most asphalt surfaces. So that's the first thing that we wanted to help mitigate is we know these urban surfaces are already hot as heck. So what trees actually can provide the shade and can stand up in their own climate resilience in the years to come. So we also have measured surface temperatures of black asphalt. This was late spring temperatures. And in late spring, we didn't really see much difference among the temperatures of the black asphalt, the synthetic turf, a concrete sidewalk, and living ground cover. So what I wanna draw your attention to is how much cooler living surfaces are. And this is because of transpiration. So during the process of transpiration, the water is actually being returned to the environment and it has a lot of cooling tendencies over time. So that's why if you look at replacing maybe a water or really thirsty cool season grass, with a drought efficient ground cover, 
that temperature is going to drop to just about 100 degrees, which is relatively cool. The other thing that's important to note is a lot of times we have a climate drought, but all the time in California, we actually have a tree drought. So we still have about 9 million trees in the state, but their density has decreased by about a third since 1988. Currently, California cities have the lowest tree canopy per capita of about 108 square yards in the United States. So that's the focus of, of uh, the research that we think that is at the position that it can be adapted pretty easily to your needs. One thing we found out is that the shade from a single tree is very powerful. It can reduce surface temperatures of asphalt more than 50 degrees along the coast, 60 degrees in Southern California, Fresno, Central California, Riverside, San Bernardino, and in the desert areas by about 70 degrees. And that's very significant. And also surrounding air temperatures can be reduced by six to 12 degrees. So one of our goals was to identify drought, heat, and pest resistant trees through collaborative research. So a team of UCANR and US Forest Service researchers came together and our trees are going in their eighth year. We're measuring the performance of the underplanted species that currently represent less than 1% of the street tree palette in California. We're looking at models that were based on CalAdapt, iTree and some of the other ones that I'll be talking about. We're looking, of course, at their heat and drought resistance. We're looking at their carbon dioxide sequestration potentials. And we're looking at their resistance to pests and their rareness so we can enhance biodiversity. The tools that we use were CalAdapt. We just had a really nice session down the hall on that. There's more to come. So I'm not gonna get into the details, but we basically looked at trees that we know are growing in warmer climate zones now and finding out which of those we should be planting in one to two degree cool zones cooler right now to be able in the next 40 to 50 years to have the resilience that they need to to maximize their ecosystem benefits. So if you're looking at planting a tree today in 10 or 15 years, it's going to start approaching its ecosystem benefits at its highest point, but it's not until you get 30, 40 or 50 years that these trees can maximize their shade. They can actually provide the largest surface of shade and they can add to the biodiversity because of the habitat presence. So also we know that 40% of trees that are planted today likely won't be alive in 20 years because of poor species selection and poor care. So we brought all that into the picture as well. We looked at Cal EPA websites and also their urban heat island projections. Of course, we looked at uh, tree canopy cover. We're looking at what we can do in low shade neighborhoods first and foremost. And then of course, CIMAS, the California Irrigation Management Information System, we use to inform us of minimum irrigation. So the second goal was to prioritize enhancing tree canopy cover in these low shade neighborhoods. This is an example of where really the power is in the partnerships. And one thing I've learned over almost 40 years in this position is that we can't and shouldn't do things alone. So we brought a wide variety of partners we brought grassroots partners, we brought organizations, we brought agencies together. We asked residents of low shade neighborhoods which trees they liked from a set palette. We talked to them about how their investment in the future will actually be magnified by their help in selecting these trees and ensuring their long-term care. And I can't overemphasize the importance of listening and developing a rapport with neighborhoods that are so low in their tree, tree canopy and most need the enhancement. This is an example of a sports park that we used one of our species from our trials in. And last year we had 100% survival and we have community members helping to check the health of the trees. We also have free helplines through our master gardener programs. And those that are receiving the trees 
that through grants we're giving away have a helpline. So if they notice that there's a pest or an insect that's plaguing their tree, they can get help right away. And that's also very, very important in the success of these programs. These neighborhoods are out in Coachella Valley. They're a mere three miles apart. You can see the ones on the left uh, have lots of water features. They have lots of turf and they have a lot of trees. The ones on the right are pretty much void of trees and are very, very hot. Climate's the same overall, but the urban heat island impact is much more stark and severe in the neighborhoods on the right. So this is just an example of a project that through these partnerships and collaborations, we've been able to provide about 1,200 trees to residents of low shade neighborhoods in San Bernardino County. These are just a few of the groups. Didn't have room for all the logos, but for each tree giveaway, we work with cities, we work with public works, we work with planners, and again, grassroots organizations to make sure that the needs that they've already identified are heard, and also to be able, through the Master Gardener Program, which is a group of trained volunteers within University of California, to be able to, to listen to a short parking lot talk it takes about five or 10 minutes and the tree species that are available are discussed, their attributes are shared. People can pick which tree fits their needs from a wide standpoint the best. And then in three months, if we haven't heard back from the tree recipients, then based on their preference of a phone call or a chat or some kind of meet back at a community room or an email, to find out not only how their trees are doing, but what's their opinion of the whole process? Are they, are they enjoying their landscape more because they have a tree? And what do they want us to know about the experience? And that's been really helpful as far as moving forward when we have these tree giveaways in fall and spring coming up in uh, 23 and 24. We also have about 20 other groups that include cities, water districts, schools, and community gardens that have been at the helm of these tree giveaways. And I wanted to end with just some shared resources that are free. Rob Benetton and I just published a paper called Benefits of Plants to Humans and Urban Ecosystems. I think the value in that is that we have about 150 citations and summaries of what the societal and urban ecosystem attributes are. So that's free. And we found that a lot of people use it to help substantiate grant dollars that they're asking for, because it does talk about the science behind all this. And more and more of us are relying on Cal Fire urban forestry grants and those kinds of things. So please feel free to, um, to use that if that would uh, help serve your needs. Also, as far as the irrigation needs of trees, we found that because of the urban heat islands being so hot, that overall the water use of a tree really isn't much more. In some cases, it's a little less than just having asphalt, no plants at all for various reasons. And that is because the effect of a tree, especially as it ages again, a very broad leaf tree cools a very large area of that urban ecosystem, reducing the water needs of plants around it. So it doesn't necessarily take any more water. So there's two papers that rather exhaustively that myself and my colleagues have summarized these um, research needs and some of the answers. One is on research and education that has influenced landscape water conservation and public policy that was done within University of California ANR. And another one on the actual water requirements of land plants that we've, through looking at CIMIS data for minimum irrigation of ground cover, turf, shrubs, and trees have developed um, how low can you go? So those are all available. And last but not least, I'm looking forward in the second hour of our session to hearing from you on 
how we can move forward together. We actually have a toolkit for our tree education and tree giveaways. And in Southern California, we're branching out from San Bernardino County into Los Angeles and Riverside County. So I was looking down the roster and many of you, I think might be interested in partnering with us. So if you are, then in the last half hour at least, I don't want to take the whole hour, but you have some pads on your table and there's going to be questions about not only do you want more from us regarding explanations of our short talks, but we'd like to hear from you on how we can help to, um, to partner with you in the future. So I think that we aren't taking questions now, so we should move on. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. There we are. Okay, that was very nice, Janet. Very nice way to start. We uh, we have seen a list of the people who are in this room, and although I come from the Department of Food and Agriculture, and I'll talk about some specific issues that are within agriculture, we're, uh, we're also uh, trying to uh, cast our net a bit wide, and um, and hopefully spark some ideas and in, in different perspectives among you too. Um, so. There are some developments that we can be thankful for in terms of decision support systems in agriculture, but there's a lot more to look forward to. Uh, so you'll get a taste of that as I as I talk. Um, I wanted you all. Uh, I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to get a bit of a exposure out there for the beta of something called the Vulnerable Communities Platform, which has only recently come online for people to see. There will be a QR code and the um, the web link of that on uh, uh, in a couple slides later, but I really think that you're a prime audience to take a look at this site, which is not complicated. And uh, there are ways to give uh, feedback and ways to volunteer your involvement of different kinds and even to participate, uh, they say, in the de further development of the tool. At the current time, this uh, tool, which is basically an interagency effort at the state level, um, it serves as a, as a compendium of different GIS layers. Uh, and first of all, there's raw data layers, which uh, which when you go online, you would see under, under the tab, all hazards. And so you would see raw data about climate, about hydrological conditions, such as stream flow predicted in the future. Um, you would see demographics, uh, some economic indicators like household income, uh, some pollution levels, particulate matter, and uh, and wildfire risk or history. I'm not not sure how that one was, but the point is, uh, at this point, the tool is is a way to pick particular uh, data sets that you're interested in that have been scattered up until now, and 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 take a look at how they might overlap. And they can be quite uh, they can be quite small scale, which could probably be good news for a lot of you. Um, Thinking further, we're hoping that at some point the uh, the the platform would be capable of computing indices, of taking particular uh, sources of raw data and doing what you want to indicate the highest risk for such and such a combination of of factors in your area of interest. At this point. All it's got really is borrowed indices that that that, have, that are already being computed elsewhere. Some of these would be familiar to many of you, like the priority populations, some social social vulnerability indices, household income, Cal and Bio screen, and uh, and the healthy places index. But the the fact that it doesn't uh, uh, compute its own indices yet it must be a point to make progress on in the future. So just a, a, a slide, I don't know if you're going to have access to this online, or you can uh, note down the um, the web link. It is not available by Googling. You do have to take you do have to take a picture here or 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 or, or take a note while I'm while I'm talking here. Um, and so they've been showing this uh, beta around at various regional workshops as part of the upcoming fifth climate change assessment by the interagency resilience group that's called ICARP. Um, there are two other points in there that, that you really should take a look at. There's a very nice resource springboard that gives you a, um, 
a list of resources and explanations of what the different data sets mean and offer and where to get other information. And there's also case studies of how they expect um, uh, the platform and its constituents to, to be useful in the future. So can I move along? <laughs> All right. Um, so the, the uh, chip on our shoulder at the Department of Food and Ag is that it is not offering much, particularly for agriculture at this point in time. And we have done work in the past under contracts, uh, not only into which uh, data are available that are of interest to agriculture, such from from the economic to the social to to uh, to cl cropping specific climatological variables, um, but we also ha have something called an agricultural vulnerability index that was developed by UC faculty that would hopefully be revitalized in a platform like this, and we would be able to form agriculture specific indices with uh, data like these, which I have verified are all readily available. At, in different sources. Um, and so that there are pes pesticide application rates, uh, flood plains, farm, historical farm disaster payments is a great way to get a, 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 a tabs on how risky a place has been um, recent, in, in recent history. Climatological variants, the, the factors that you could borrow from CalAdapt. Um, yeah. And another thing we've been talking about in the department is broadband access, which is very much, it might be hard to fit into an index, but is very much of interest in precision agriculture moving forward and allowing economic uh, development in, in the agricultural realm. So uh, it, it, I imagine a number of you might have been at the CalAdapt uh, 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 session. I was not able to make it myself. Um, up until now, CalAdapt ha has been improving a little bit from the perspective of agriculture. It it has a few um, a few tools now that are of use to an enterprising agriculturalist. Of course, at maximum and minimum temperatures that are expected in the future in in, in their area of interest. Uh, the maps of projected change in those extreme heat days, extreme weather probability, extended drought scenario, all that could be quite uh, useful to someone who, who's really trying to, to, to look into the future. Um, but we see quite a bit of, of potential for improvement here. And CalAdapt is undergoing a user needs assessment now, and it is um, being opened up for further development. So we just wanted to mention some of the things that we have talked about at, at the agency level and that we'd be pushing for. We could easily create a wizard on, in, in the tool that would pro provide growing degree days, which are important for, for assessing the, uh, the aptitude of, of, of a particular area for a crop in the future. Um, chill hours should be more doable with the progress towards an hourly uh, uh, modeling basis for the CalAdapt, whereas in previous times it was it was a daily uh, time step. Uh, improved wind speed predictions, which again are not great when you're just using daily modeling, but now hourly should be should be uh, better allow uh, allow us to see extremes in wind. Um, and lastly, I'll just uh, coast a little bit over and, and, and say that when an agriculturalist likes maybe some of your own stakeholders looks at a tool like CalAdapt for the future, it's also important to think about do they, whether they understand the probabilities and the risk levels that they are looking at. So whether it's a particular range, yep, whether it's a particular range of, uh, of scenarios that they're looking at on the same graph or error bars or what have you, we do need to, to, to think about that and maybe explain it to, to people who would, who would take advantage of our tools. The last thing I will talk about um, is the California Climate Information System which got an, a year ago $16 million in the budget. And you will not see it this at the local level very soon, but they have an ambition to build in a better spatial geographical data sharing system at the agency level to allow people to work with both uh, integrating current and predicted climatological data um, and, and, uh, and remote sensing data. 
Um, it's it, it's being the contract is spearheaded by the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, though there are no jets involved. But I imagine it has to do with things that fly and and remote sensing. Um, and so they're hoping to automate uh, a, a fair number of analytical processes that happen with pest prediction um, or with hydrological prediction at the state level. Um, and it's worth mentioning, if you'd like to give us some feedback, uh, they're also talking about what public facing tools could be proposed. If, if you understand well enough the, uh, the, the, the sort of broad based platform that they're talking about and the combination of data and making state data more available to local users, please let me know what your ideas might be. And just the last thing I'll say, we have in the past um, received a number of requests from people for climate atlases. Where will crops be good in the future? It's a little hard to predict because the crops change, not just because we have some uncertainty in the in in, in the in the uh, climatological predictions. Um, crops get bred uh, to adapt to different conditions over time, or market conditions change. But we but we would like to make climate change atlases uh, uh, happen in the near future. And we have so far uh, developed a, a guide here that you see a page out of for the San Diego, San Diego region, uh, giving, giving a text and hazard-based rundown of the scenario in the coming decades for each, uh, each particular major crop of the region. So, so you could see that if you're interested, uh, you might come from the area, uh, you could Google CDFA climate change consortium and, and see that. So thank you very much for, for listening and I'll be around to, uh, to talk with anyone or hear ideas. Thanks. Yeah, space bar in there. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Bob, my, as my slide says, I'm Bob Klein. I'm with the California Pistachio Research Board. I also manage the Administrative Committee for Pistachios, which are terms that probably don't ring a bell with any of you, but it will come to that, those explanations. When we looked over, the previous speaker mentioned that we saw a list of the attendees today. And I looked at the, at the list of speakers across the whole forum and, uh, there's very few agriculturalists in the audience or as speakers. So I'm assuming that most of you have very little knowledge of how agriculture is structured in the state. So I thought I would probably be best if I explained what we do. Um, and I'm being a little presumptuous in saying lessons to be learned. It's more just stories. It's not, I'm not trying to instruct you on anything. So California is the number one agricultural state in the nation, by far, uh, $55 billion industries um, overall. Uh, the next closest state, I think, is Texas, and it's about $40 billion. Um, we are double the size of Iowa as an ag economy. But you usually don't think of California as being that agricultural, but it is. We grow over 300 different crops, but the top 10 crops make up about 65% of the cash value. So we have a very diverse agriculture um, that's quite top heavy. Under state and federal law, commodities are allowed to organize themselves without, re without worrying about collusion. We organize ourselves in marketing orders, commissions, research and promotion programs, all depending on what piece of legislation is used to justify your existence. They're all under state or federal um, supervision. The California Pistachio Research Board is a state marketing order, so it's under state. The Administrative Committee is a federal marketing order, so we're under federal. Um, almost always these commissions or marketing orders are initiated by growers. And they all have to be periodically um, reauthorized by a referendum. They all operate on mandatory assessments, which means that the growers assess themselves, they tax themselves to run the operations of the marketing orders or commissions they put in place. So we, uh, the, the assessments can vary widely. Um, the, the assessment we have right now on pistachios is 
0.15 cents per pound is paid by the grower. The almond board has an assessment of about three and a half cents a pound, but that's because they have different activities as well. And there are over 50 California marketing orders um, or commissions, plus there's federal marketing orders and all. They run a wide range of different crops. You can have from alfalfa seed, there's a sea urchin commission, there's pistachio, there's almonds, um, there's dairy boards, and various things on that order. So you get a wide range of things. Each marketing order is different and we can only do what we're allowed to in our program. So in my program, we do not have we do not have authority to market. We're a marketing order, but we don't market. So you can only do what you have there. So some of them do marketing, and that includes promotion, inventory management. Um, they have sometimes have set aside programs to maintain certain amounts on the market. Public relations. We also have governmental relations, but the federal marketing orders can't lobby. So anything I say that could be construed as lobbying on the federal side, I wear my California Pistachio Research Board hat. And then when I talk with the feds, I can wear my federal hat. So we run things like that. We collect statistics. So including acreage, our production, where we make, uh, what our inventory is and where we make our shipments. And this data is used by the USDA, by uh, various uh, California agencies and all to publish uh, their statistics. We also do research. And when I say research, I'm talking about production research on growing the crop. Um, a lot of promotion is done now on human nutrition. And we don't, in our, in my order, we don't consider that research. That's promotion. Um, so we do only production research and only grower and grower education. And we only do research that is not, production research is not intended for promotional activities. So we don't, when we talk about, we can have research done to promote, to look at sustainable ag practices, but we're not looking at doing that, those to promote our crop as sustainable. We're doing it to answer questions about how you would grow it sustainably. For California pistachios in particular, the industry started in 1976. Prior to that, there were no real commercial pistachios in California. So we're a very young industry. Um, 1976, 1.5 million pounds from 4,500 acres. We've had continuous growth since then. We're now producing over 1.2 billion pounds from over 450,000 bearing acres of pistachios, we have about 550,000 total acres. Pistachios take about six years from planting to get to the first yield, first crop. So we have a lot of long non-bearing period. 95% of the production is in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. And the remainder is in the Sac Valley. There's 1,500 grower entities. We keep track of growers by their tax ID numbers. Um, rather than by personal ID. And the owners range anything from family farms to retirement funds. One of the uh, larger growers is the Texas Teachers Retirement Fund. Um, so there's a lot of pistachios are, are used widely as retirement vehicles. Um, pistachios require relatively cold winters. You can't grow them on the coast. Uh, it doesn't get cold enough along the coast. You have to have hot, dry summers. And I say dry. You can barely grow them in Arizona and New Mexico because they have monsoon rains and pistachios do not like rain on their leaves. So they have to be dry the whole time. And of course, you have to have adequate water. When I say relatively cold winters, we need 600 to 700 hours of chill, which will define roughly as less, any temperature under 45 degrees. Again, no rain during the summer, 40 inches of water, they're very salt tolerant and drought resistant. 
the trees are very long lived. Um, almonds last about 25 years. Pistachios were saying will go for 80 years or until the trees become too massive to shake to harvest. The research board was begun in 2007, which means we reauthorized three times now. And we always have about 95% support of the growers. We have nine members, four alternates, one public member. CPRB is limited to production research and grower education, as I said. The board members set the research priorities. And we send a, re, uh, a request for proposals out annually, primarily to UC and USDA researchers. We normally fund over two and a half million dollars in research for every year, and typically, typically about 40 projects. When we look at climate adaptation, we're particularly concerned about declining chill hours over the past few decades. And none of the models are very encouraging about what the future is going to bring. We need a better understanding of what the chill conditions are and how to mitigate that. And we also look at breeding for varieties with lower chill requirements. Higher temperatures that the future is going to bring increased pest and pathogen pressure, they shorten pest generation times and increase pest populations. We try to always work on better models for pest populations, and uh, almost all the models are used to predict pesticide application times. We try to do weather monitoring. We've in the past used the uh, SIMA stations uh, um, uh, under DWR. We find those to be inadequately maintained and their value in, in, for our growers is pretty compromised. So we're putting out 30 plus research stations and pistachio orchards up and down the San Joaquin Valley and Sac Valley. And we'll use that data then exported to UC Davis, the Fruit and Nut Research Center, and they'll be used for chill models, crop maturation, and pest population models. Always concerned about water supply. Pistachios are almost always under um, drip systems. It's the way it has been since the beginning. Uh, so we, we're as close to being, we monitor our water use very tightly. Um, we still do a lot of time on irrigation uniformity. Um, pistachios are salt tolerant to a degree, so we look at a lot of saline irrigation and uh, the use of cover crops. Most of our outreach in this climate ad adaptation stuff would be through the uh, Fruit and Nut Research Center at Davis, as I mentioned. For us, when we look at adaptation, we growers and the CPRB have to look at economics both in the short and the long term. Can't lose money for more than a few years in a row. Um, most climate, climate adaptability for us is dealt with on a short term because we have to look at what it does on a yearly basis. We can breed for a variety that has lower chill. Chill still varies from year to year, from orchard to orchard, and you have to be able to manage that chill variability on a yearly basis. Um, our research, our futures, are, when we look at it, our research is hampered by the lack of unknown endpoints. We never know what the climate's going to bring. Models can say one thing, but that doesn't mean that the models are going to deliver that with great accuracy. And we don't have a whole bunch of researchers to do the work. Our budgets are also limited and they have to be split between the immediate issues, the trade issues like pesticide residues, the flooding we had this year, mycotoxins, um, aflatoxin particularly, quality issues. We have what I call looming issues, invasive pests. So we, were, we're, we have been concerned about brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, we're concerned now about spotted lanternfly. Uh, these are pests we haven't dealt with in the past and nobody that grows pistachios around the world has ever dealt with. So um, how much time we want to spend addressing that in advance um, is always a question. And then of course, we always have to worry about what I call regulatory adaptability. We have irrigated land research, um, regulatory program. We have um, CV salts, we have nitrogen, we have a number of all these other issues that we generally have to do research on then so we can manage the mandates that we're handed. And this affects how we respond to climate adaptability in the future. 
and with that, I think I've run out of time. So I'd be happy to answer any questions in, after the presentation. Thanks. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Roman Mendley. I'm a uh, the climate change action coordinator for our integrated watershed management programs for the Department of Water Resources. I just ran recently joined the executive group. My background is in engineering, so I'm looking more at it on the technical aspect rather than like more the uh, natural aspects in general, even though my background is also in environmental engineering science. Um, a lot of research is being done in the department. Uh, I was not going to provide all the tools that are developing and try to like just focus on what we're doing internally uh, to better educate our decision-making inside the department. So, not so much about like the tool available for the general public, uh, but at the end of my presentation, I'll talk about uh, some of the research I think are, are key. So internal to the department, uh, we take climate change very seriously. We have our climate action plan, which is a three phase plan. Uh, phase one is greenhouse gas emission. And I need to remind people that greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas uh, reduction is our best adaptation strategy. And, and we shouldn't forget about that. As soon as we can reduce our greenhouse gas emission, we may have a better um, opportunity to, to, to not need more uh, robust adaptation in general. And then uh, phase two and three are really my uh, subject matter of expertise. Uh, phase two is about our climate change analysis. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then phase three is our vulnerability and adaptation inside the department. And I have Vanessa here. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, she can answer some questions about our vulnerability assessments report and adaptation plan. So the department didn't wait to do climate change analysis. We already started to do climate change analysis back in 2006. Uh, you can see like really uh, two trend of type of analysis. Uh, one I call top down downscaling analysis. We're taking the general circulation models and we apply it to our system, and then a, a bottom up decision scaling analysis. Uh, and I will describe these two. And that's kind of like the favorite uh, direction we're taking as a department to inform our decisions. So what is a a top down analysis? Uh, what you do is like you take your general circulation models, your greenhouse gas emission risk scenarios. Uh, the multiple um, um, variants of the scenarios, we downscale them and we apply them to a system model. So in hydrology and hydraulics and all our system operation of reservoirs, we have very complex uh, analysis we're doing that we feed this uh, information into. And then that provide us a, uh, you know, a, a future condition of performance of my system. The challenge is, well, you know, do we cover the whole range of authority? And we always struggle with that as water resources engineer. How much, how robust do we need to build our system? Uh, would the results be different if I was using a different approach to our technical analysis? Uh, also a big struggle in our industry. And how likely is this future? What is the risk? And I think that's for an engineer, uh, we like to go to the casino and have a good uh, chance on our bets, right? We we don't want to get out of the casino empty buckets. So that's kind of like the one approach and that's the most current approach that folks are using. The second approach is a, a bottom-up decision scanning approach. Uh, we still use the GCM, don't get me wrong. I think the GCM are the best information about the future conditions. But rather to use it right away, because we know that every five years is gonna be a new set of data, we are focusing mostly on our system performance. So I start with a systematic way to perturb historical data that I throw in my system model. And I do a stress test analysis like we do in R&Ds uh, in, 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 you know, in our industry. So by creating this time series or using a time series I perturb and throwing it down my system operation, I can understand what are the shortfall of my system, at what point my system is gonna to start to, to fail. What are the tipping point of my system? And then that creates some sort of like nice, you can make it a one dimensional, two dimensional. As soon as we get to the three dimensional, we start to lose people. So we, we stay at the two dimensional aspect, but we, we are able to understand how, you know, my flood condition, my water supply condition, uh, the ecosystem may respond to like different change in the variability uh, of, of climate change stressors. 
And then we relate this request response to the future condition of uh, climate change. So uh, I'm able to quantify what is the risk. There is a nice article uh, for the environmental folks here, Puff on the Owl, uh, who look at restoration of floodplain inundation and, and how with climate change, what kind of type of sizing we could do for floodplain re restoration. So that's, that's the first piece in the department is really how we are approaching climate change analysis and we are developing this tool to be consistent throughout the department. Uh, the second phase of uh, the first phase of our plan is our VNFC assessment adaptation plan. And we uh, developed in 2019 uh, a VNRT assessment where we look at wildfire, uh, extreme heat, sea level rise, long-term persistent hydrologic changes, uh, short-term extreme hydrologic changes, and habitat and ecosystem uh, services impacts. Uh, that was, I think, one of the first VNRT assessments done by the state of California by a agency. And then the next phase was really to understand how this vulnerability is going to impact our system. And so we look into what, as a department, we own and manage and take care of. That means the staff safety uh, based on the extreme heat, the still water project loss in performance, the Upper Feather River watershed wildfire, because the Upper Feather feed into Oroville will provide water here in, in, in Southern California. And then landscape, ecosystem, and habitat, stress on species and habitat. And again, that's Vanessa's um, um, subject matter expertise is a landscape where we are developing processes to understand how we could adapt our different ecosystem based on the geolocation of the land that we are managing. So that's the internal tools that we develop. Uh, I don't want to get out of this presentation without providing <laughs> any research uh, direction. And so um, I, 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 a couple months ago, the Office of Planning and Research asked us to provide them a list of research need uh, in relation to the fifth climate assessment. Obviously, there is many research we can do, and I'm sure that they couldn't cover all our needs. And so here's a list of, of key elements that I, I, I would like to point out. So the first one is identify gaps in monitoring infrastructure to track a changing climate. So what we mean by that is identifying opportunities to augment the existing observation networks to detect change in key climate impact zones. So for example, the rain, snow uh, lines, the habitat types, the connectivity between the habitats, uh, the tidal inundation flood zone aspect. Uh, we are still not uh, proactively doing enough in, in my perspective. Or also like land subsidence of our uh, groundwater aquifers. Obviously we have a lot of buildings uh, who are under groundwater uh, on the aquifer. And so we need to make sure that we understand like if they are going to fail or not. Um, so that's kind of uh, the first one. Identify and promote adaptation actions. I have a long list here. Um, so provide analysis and example of adaptation pathways. We are calling adaptation pathways uh, a way to like size our adaptation strategies over time. And it's been like really used a lot on sea level rise perspective because it's a one dimensional. But when you think about integrated watershed management, integrated water management is a multi-dimensional aspect. And so doing adaptation pathways is not very practical. And I still didn't see any uh, good publication on how to adapt thinking about the multi water sector aspects. The adaptation cost and potential funding mechanism. Um, I understand that, you know, maybe having a, more tools to understand how we fund different projects, how we size them, um, including adaptation pathways could be a very good research uh, needs. There is this climate resilience districts who are being formed uh, where we could start to look into that, uh, but I think we need to scale it up in general. Impact of management action on water temperature. So. Again, um, how uh, change in temperature is going to impact our ecosystem in general, but also our adaptations toward the ecosystem or in the watershed is going to impact the water temperature in general. Uh, identifying tipping points, that's, I think, like uh, something we could uh, easily do uh, using a stress test analysis, but yet we are not doing it because I think we are too fearful to point out like when our system is going to fail uh, as a society. I mean, it's scary, right? And then uh, project design, which encourage flexibility. I think there is a lot in the engineering world thinking about the levy design 
and, and how we size our infrastructure based on future condition, we need to build flexibility in our engineering practices and, and, and we're still uh, far away from it. I'm gonna have, a little bit, I'm gonna take, take a little bit more time. Uh, number three, improved forecasting capability supporting climate resiliency. Um, obviously, we on all this research needs, we're investing a lot as a department, but we need more. Uh, obviously, our ability to forecast future conditions, uh, even like, you know, in a, a daily, seasonal, year-to-year uh, -year basis is going to help us by us time to adapt and like be able to absorb uh, the climate change stressors. And so a lot of investment in S2S uh, season to uh, season to uh, season forecast is very important. Number four, um, encourage and support collaborative scenario planning. I took a lot about like stress test analysis that's our preferred approach, uh, but you know, often using so many scenarios, you kind of like diluting, uh, you know, very specific, uh, more precise decision making. And so building or, or trying to combine top down stress analysis with bottom up uh, approach or, or downscaling approach could generate uh, scenarios who are more palatable uh, to local entities. If they understand how the system perform and we are building scenarios who are based on their system performance, we can uh, have a better buy-in in general. I'm going to skip a little bit for time purposes. Uh, utilize social science to understand and improve adaptive, um, uh, adaptive capacity. So how to enhance the participation of buy-in? I think there is a lot of like tools and effort for the state and globally on like to bring people in. Uh, I would love to see like kind of like a library of approach on how you are interacting with local entities to take decision making. Uh, we are doing a little bit of that statewide, but I think we can definitely uh, make people more involved. Also, on the governance st structure, when you talk about the watershed, you have many entities. And so who should be the leading entity at the watershed? And who should be the key actors to provide like the information? So uh, would be very important. Uh, next one's ecosystem ecological impacts on adaptation uh, mitigation opportunities. Um, is developing tools who are able to uh, understand the ability to respond to changing ecosystem services. Obviously, uh, we often um, design a restoration based on a specific ecosystem. It doesn't mean that the ecosystem is going to stay the same with the, in face of climate change. And so trying to understand how the ecosystem is going to like um, change the services is going to be important on like what are the trigger we're going to change the ecosystem. Um, also understanding like where are the location of invasive species. Uh, just I think recently we I heard that like in the LA area where there is an infestation of like flies from Asia, uh, invasive species, and we had to had to do a lockdown to like maintain these flies to like uh, go further than like this specific uh, neighborhood. And so having tools to understand like, you know, when is this invasive species can come in, how to uh, keep them at the location to try to not spread them further could be also like a, a very important tool. And then wildlife impact uh, on water resources, obviously there is a lot of research need here. The state is investing a lot on wildfire uh, these last five years and for good reason, uh, but there is a lot of sedimentation uh, from burn area was getting into our reservoirs. And so how do we mitigate uh, the sediment uh, was going down the river? What is the impact of the sediments for the, on the ecosystem? Developing tools to understand like how to mitigate, adapt, uh, you know, future condition in the watershed is gonna be very important. Or uh, the impact of flame retardants on the aquatic, aquatic ecosystem. There is still like more need of research on, on that area. So I, I just give you a few example, obviously a few, quite a few example, um, but there is definitely like a lot of research need um, in water sources and a lot of tool to be developed uh, for a better uh, decision making. And I had a last sentence here, the disparity research area uh, with state and collaborative science initiative, including KFAC uh, climate action plan, Delta science action agenda and the water resilience portfolio. So it was like a, a, a consensus of research that I put together 
uh, that we we provided to to other state agencies. And on that note, I'll stop here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for staying with us. Um, this is so all the speakers did a great job finishing within time ish. Uh, <laughs> I'm and the last one uh, for the set of uh, uh, presentations, and um, I'm going to talk just very specific tool that we created uh, specific for agriculture. It's called Cal Agro Climate. Um, it's uh, it's a this tool we launched uh, start of January, so it's about six, six seven months ago. Um, just to give a perspective, when we think about data, we have more than enough data, right? So we have enough than, uh, you know, more than we can really digest and, and make use of it. The real challenge is how can we translate this information or data or tools or resources into something really useful and usable products. And when I think about agriculture, um, that's that's one of the big challenges is how can we translate this information into a meaningful decision support system? Um, you know, I, I give an example of CDFA. They, they did this uh, um, 2013 consortium on climate change. And so one of the talk recommendation was coming up with uh, growers need for climate and weather information that's relevant for them. We did a series of focus group and interviews uh, with one of the uh, the scientists, Kripa Jagannathan. She she did a project in extension and then we published this paper recently. And you know there is very specific from almond growers that you know, growers really need crop specific information. So how can we, really use all this or, or translate this information into uh, something that growers can use. And so we created this Cal Agro climate system and we are trying to, to make uh, uh, the products more relevant for agricultural applications. Um, this is the team, I'm not the only one uh, launched this product. There's uh, uh, people uh, really worked um, on, on the coding side and, and, and you know the interface side from IGIS partners from USDA California Climate Hub um, and, and the project scientist is working with me on, on this project. Uh, we have funding from USDA and, and uh, UC Office of President and a few other sources. And so we are trying to keep it afloat. Um, for now, we have uh, uh, four tools, heat advisory, frost advisory, crop phenology, pest advisory. And then we recently added agroclimatic indicators. So these are all the climate indicators, but very specific to agriculture. And so uh, we are trying to, to make it more focused on agricultural applications. In terms of the data set, so we are not using um, the GCM or, or um, uh, weather station data. What we are using is PRISM graded data source. And uh, the PRISM, the free source uh, that's available is a four kilometer by four kilometer. Uh, we really invested in a uh, high resolution data set, which is PRISM 800, which is 800 meter resolution, uh, graded data source for last uh, 40 plus years. And so uh, the data is, is not a free source, but we purchased it, but the tools that we are providing is all free resource for agricultural community or anyone who want to use this information. And in terms of the information, you know, what you get in four kilometers by 800 meter resolution is about, you know, third times more. Uh, so it's, it's really useful information. I'll quickly skip through this um, and, and you can feel free to go to this uh, website, calagroclimate.org to, to uh, see what these tools are and, and how they are useful. Frost and, and heat advisory tools are really the very simple ones. We are using the National Weather Service seven day forecast, but instead of making it this uh, you know, uh, complicated one, what we are trying to do is um, you know, they can pick their um, uh, threshold temperatures uh, given the crop. And then this tool is just talking about, you know, how many consecutive days your temperature is going to be above or below normal or below the threshold value, sorry, not the normal. 
And I think when it comes to crops, one day exposing to heat or frost versus three or four consecutive days makes a huge difference. And so we are uh, trying to make this heat and frost advisory risk relevant to, to agricultural needs. Uh, for crop phenology too, we have um, roughly about 12 to 15 particular crops. And we have information specific to the variety uh, for those individual crops. And, and in this case, grow, you know, users can pick the, the crop variety, their location, and the threshold values they are relevant to, to this crop uh, growth stages. And the, the tool can help uh, help growers make decisions in terms of you know, um, uh, management uh, aspects or timing of different applications, et cetera. And the same way we are also uh, developed this uh, pest advisory tool, which works on the same phenomena using the growing degree day uh, to, to provide advisory on, on the pest generations. And they can, you, user can compare current year versus any number of historical years. Sometimes farmers are interested in, you know, well, 2015 was an interesting year uh, and I wanna compare. And so they can even pick and choose a particular year in the past to compare to the current year um, and, and, and sort of see the comparison of how uh, things have changed uh, in a current year. And we have the series of uh, agroclimatic indicators. These are all based on that 800 meter resolution that I talked about. Um, and we are aggregating at the county scale. The reason why we did the, the county scale and not the pixel value is because, you know, when you're clicking on, the, uh, on a pixel, which doesn't represent the, the county aggregate, then you might have the trend completely different, right? And so, we we uh, user can select any county in in California and and you can get the trend over the last forty years. Again, this is not a projection; uh, it's a historical uh, forty plus years, including the the current year. Okay, um, this is just one example of uh, how you can see the trend over time on on the agroclimatic indicator. Well, I'll skip the next steps. I'll, I'll stop here because I'm one of the session organizers, so we take the the beat on on finishing up on time. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, this is my contact information. Feel free to uh, email me or or contact me uh, if you have any questions.